there's a, after the Rwandan genocide, uh, Kofi Annan appealed to the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, saying, how do we overcome this challenge between sovereignty and humanitarian intervention? Because every time we see something like this, the country says, internal issues stay out. Uh, and the Canadian government, MacArthur Foundation, created this commission on intervention and state sovereignty. And they produced this report called Responsibility to Protect. And it sort of looked at how can we get better as an international community, as well as domestic, at preventing and stopping these things. And they look at it at a continuum. So it's prevention, reaction, rebuilding. So the prevention part is if you hear Jews being called vermin, if you hear Tootsies being called cockroaches, and my concern uh, with Christopher just talking about North Korea and uh, um, Iran is that things like Rwanda, which don't have nukes, we we it's then it, that they don't fit that paradigm, and then we don't pay attention when something like the genocide in 1994 happened. So you can commit genocide with simple farming tools. You don't need Tomahawk missiles or nukes or F-14s. You can use machetes uh, to commit genocide. So we need to get much better at uh, seeing these early warning signs. We need to get better at the early reaction. Diplomat diplomatic, economic, carrots and sticks. Military, we need to make sure that we've got the mandate and the resources. Big problem with UN peacekeeping um, missions is that they're sometimes don't have the mandates, aren't trained, don't have the resources. We need helicopters, for example, uh, for the UN mission in, in Sudan. And then the last one is rebuilding, and that is one of the biggest indicators for a genocide is if there's been previous mass atrocities, and you don't end the culture of impunity, hold people accountable, and don't jumpstart the economy. We have the Marshall Plan in Europe. We tend to not look at helping create jobs. Uh, usually uh, one person at the UN says two things you need, is jobs for young men and education for women to help get them outside of that conflict track. So a seventh P is, is, is power, use of hard and soft power. You know, the worst atrocity, diplomatic atrocity I hear on a daily basis in Washington from every person that I've talked to in the White House and in Congress is the United States no longer has any leverage in the world. Well, that's a, a gross underestimate of the United States, the most powerful nation in the world's continuing ability when we wield the tools that we have and for purposes that we really want to, uh, to accomplish, um, I, I feel that that is a, a vast underestimation of what we can do. So using the tools that are in our disposal, hard and soft, our tools of power, our kind of willingness to use them in defense of uh, human rights of the nature we've talked about all the evening would be, would be another P I'd throw in there since we're trying to try and alliterate. <laughs> Great. Hey. My question is more about um, after a genocide has happened, um, specifically kind of talking with examples from Rwanda, um, kind of aimed at John Kerry, yeah, sorry. Um, what do you think the role of communal courts in Darfur could be? Um, I was kind of surprised that you didn't list that as one of um, the things that could be focused on as a response. And how do you think, in general, um, like thinking on a macro level, something like the Genocide Inter Intervention Network could work after genocide has happened to um, help repatriate and make amends? Well, you heard from what I was saying in the talk, I don't believe the genocide has ended in Gulf War. It was just right. kind of being undertaken by the mean. So the, the, the applicability of the post-genocide environment in Rwanda where victor's justice in the context of uh, localized, local communal courts, which is really one of the only ways they could undertake such a massive uh, just, justice-seeking and reconciliation-seeking effort. Um, we're not there yet in Darfur. Uh, however, um, in, in the context of the peace process now, uh, introducing elements involving uh, post-conflict judicial mechanisms, state, local, and international, is crucial if we're going to have a sustainable peace in Darfur. We're not, according to, on the basis of this current whitewash that's going on in, in, uh, in Doha today. In terms peace process that they're calling it uh, now for Darfur. But if a 
serious peace process were to follow in the footsteps of the failure that we're going to see unfold over the next few months, uh, it would involve a comprehensive approach to the issues that have spawned the conflict, which then spawned the genocide, one of which is the cycle of impunity that needs to be addressed at multiple levels, including how the communities can be involved in their own way, using their traditions, not the Rwandan traditions, how those kinds of uh, approaches can be maximized and supported locally, at the state level, and internationally. Yeah, Mark, I was especially, take, <coughs> excuse me, especially taken by the word permanence you use in terms of institutionalizing the movement. Obviously, to a certain degree, that's mobilizing people to be permanent with it and also getting a fluid enough, fluid enough labor force to help you along at various times of the way. On college campuses, for, for example, where a lot of this will germinate and develop, have you any thought of modeling public interest research group type labor, or even you made the reference that we respond so well to uh, natural calamity, this, the same short-term labor in this regard as people for years have been going down to help re rebuild New Orleans for weekends, for short terms. Any, Anything like that that might be of interest to this group in terms of actually giving days as opposed to indeed that 15 minutes you were talking about. Yeah, that's a great question. So we've uh, our, we've studied a lot of how other groups uh, mobilize on their issues. So we've met and researched the NRA, Move On, Sierra Club, APAC, folks on the family, looking at how do they, what are the best practices that they use to mobilize uh, citizens pressure their policymakers. And so we've created, the, with, with students coming out of Georgetown and GW, created uh, the, anti, the Students Anti-Genocide Coalition Stand. Um, so there's tiers of engagements where you can give 15 minutes a week, uh, or you can uh, become a chapter leader. You can get involved in our student board, so it's, it's by and for students. Um, they come up with the programs, they just need to stay within budget and the law. Uh, and students, were, that was one of the uh, things that we had learned with student organizing, that that's, uh, students want to have as much autonomy as possible. Um, so we uh, do multiple things throughout the year. We've got campaigns, like some of the events I mentioned, that people can give days. Uh, as you're hearing, gen uh, it's weird that April is a month that every major genocide is commemorated. Uh, the Holocaust, Cambodia, Armenia, uh, Sudan, all well, have many days that you can take action to commemorate. Month, which is take action. Okay. Sorry? In the wasteland, it's here, so it begins by saying April is the cruelest month. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it doing this here? Uh, so there's that. We also team up with Enough and Save Our Four and hold a national conference uh, in the fall. So we had a thousand people come in November. We're going to do it as, uh, as often as people want to come to DC, train them on how a bill becomes a law, how to organize, how to fundraise, how to write op eds. And then the, the, we do that the first two days. Uh, they hear from experts talking about uh, the areas of mass atrocities. And then the third day, we set up appointments for them to uh, go on Capitol Hill and lobby their members of Congress. And in fact, between March 29th and April 9th, we've got a whole, all these days we've got